that let me clear uh, a few points uh, uh, that are uh, our number one this study specifically have focused on five uh, agroecological zones mainly the uh, dry mountains of Balochistan and Khyber Pakhtunkhwa as well as the irrigated and desert lands of Sindh and this was intentionally selected uh, 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 this was this area was intentionally selected for this study mainly because of the uh, past trends, if we look at the past few years, then the climate is uh, uh, has adversely hit these areas. For example, if we look at the 2017, 18, 19 droughts that were prevailing in, but at the same time, we observed that in uh, early 2020, uh, the, these areas of Sin and Balochistan were experiencing the flood and snow emergencies. So uh, this is the one, uh, one fantastic example of the uh, climate change and, and how this climate change is, is impacting our lives and livelihoods. So that uh, on one hand, there was a, a peak drought. And then at the same time, when there was one that uh, humanitarian partners and government were planning for the drought response at the same time after one month, uh, we were experiencing the snow and flood emergencies in areas. So I think that uh, we need to uh, uh, seriously consider uh, this climate change uh, variable specifically in, in these areas where the communities of the sectoral, uh, sectoral issues in, in these areas are already living below the poverty line. And when they experience these additional shocks, uh, they are not able to sustain their lives and livelihood. So this is one point. And second uh, point that I would like to clarify is that here in, the, in this study, we have taken the agroecological zones as proxy to livelihood zone um, because the livelihood zones are not existent in Pakistan. And it's only agroecological zones that were established by Pakistan Agriculture Research Council in 1980. We consider those uh, agroecological zones as proxy to livelihood zone. Although I understand that over the past 40 years since this agroecological zones were established, the climate change has severely changed the on-ground situation. And now if we uh, revise this agroecological zone that maybe we uh, have a different uh, uh, agroecological zones as compared to this one. So we uh, we also need to look into this that how we can revise this agroecological zones or we can establish the livelihood zones for better decision making and programming. Over. Uh, thank you, Mr. Harsa, for adding valuable points to our presentation. And uh, I hope uh, the colleagues from Whitefield program will be staying with us because uh, there might be some questions. So thank you both of you for presentation. Now I would uh, move to the other part of the, uh, the session and some of the specialized presentations on ecosystem restoration. So starting from uh, the house here in presence, I would request uh, Mr. Salman Danish to present uh, his uh, policy papers, uh, you know, key points on the marine ecosystem of Pakistan. Over to you, Salman. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shafi. So, is on marine ecosystem restoration, uh, which includes mangroves and uh, tidal marshes and other blue economy uh, ventures. So uh, as an introduction, uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar that Pakistan has a uh, almost 1,000 kilometer long uh, coastline, which connects the two provinces, the Balochistan and Sindh provinces. 
and uh, we also have the seventh largest arid mangrove ecosystem in the Indus Delta. And uh, our eco uh, marine ecosystem is connected to livelihoods of millions of people provide food and oxygen to all kinds of uh, uh, sea products. And uh, our ports, uh, Karachi and Gwadar ports, they uh, also have the potential to become. And uh, here we will e examine the marine ecosystem diversity, carbon, uh, blue carbon specifically, and its linkages to the economy. And uh, as, uh, next slide please. So uh, mangroves in Pakistan, they occupy uh, an area of 1,464 square kilometers as per 2020 data. And uh, mangrove forests and tidal marshes, they are estimated to store 21 million tons of organic carbon or 76 million uh, tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. And uh, this is not a small number. So uh, normally it's said that trees are the lungs of the environment, but uh, it should also be noted that uh, the blue economy, the blue uh, resources, they are also major carbon sinks and producers of oxygen. Uh, and this, uh, these numbers, they give encouragement for the plantation of mangroves. Uh, and the Sin uh, Forest Department has already been uh, working on this. They have successfully increased the number and the area of cultivation of ma uh, mangrove forests. Uh, apart from that, Pakistan has also recently done a rapid assessment of the blue carbon profile to World Bank so that we can take the appropriate actions and uh, modify our NDCs. NDCs are our nationally determined contributions. And uh, this uh, revision, uh, will help us increase commitments through blue carbon uh, or marine ecosystems and uh, devise uh, NDC carbon reduction commitments through carbon sequestration and adaptation measures. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. speak uh, a bit about the threats to our uh, marine ecosystems. So uh, one huge threat is the uh, over-exploitation of any resource. And same is the case with the uh, marine ecosystems. And our, uh, the problem is that our marine resources have been uh, so over-exploited for short-term gain. Uh, and this will lead to degradation of our mangroves and our other uh, resources. And uh, that's just not uh, viable in the long term. And uh, the, uh, carelessness towards uh, our resources, especially plastic pollution. I'm sure we're all uh, aware of plastic pollution problems, single-use plastics. And uh, it, this also includes uh, toxic waste dumping from the companies and the manufacturers. Uh, that's a major issue. And on top of everything, Climate change itself, like we've been discussing in this panel already, climate change itself is a huge threat to the ecosystems and the same goes for marine ecosystems. And uh, the main uh, problem is uh, ocean, oh, sorry, ocean acidification and the warming of the seas themselves. And these can lead to uh, coral reefs dying off and other marine systems such as mangroves being majorly affected. So uh, I've mentioned mangroves a couple of times here. So let's get into what actually are. Okay, so mangroves, basically uh, mangroves are in tropical and subtropical regions with special adaptations to survive in the salty seawater. And the key characteristic for a plant to be considered a mangrove is its ability to uh, survive saline environments. And uh, this has developed in several different families of plants uh, they can be small trees, they can be large shrubs, they can be any kind of uh, plant. And uh, the term mangrove uh, is usually applied to both individual plants and plant ecosystems. So uh, sometimes these mangroves are in clusters, different plants performing different functions, but the, together they're called uh, a mangrove. So uh, these mangroves, they also act as uh, nurseries for uh, fish. Fish can lay eggs there, 
we have turtles there we have a lot of uh, biodiversity in these uh, mangroves but the problem is uh, our pollution our toxic discharges from uh, sewage and uh, chemical water they are polluting and harming these environments and these are also excellent nurseries for shrimp and other shellfish at a global level there is a broad recognition that the marine coastal areas face unprecedented human induced threats from industries such as fishing transportation and the waste disposal specifically waste uh, and toxic uh, chemical disposal uh, and uh, uh, these need to be addressed before we can uh, take advantage proper and sustainable advantage of these ecosystems uh, next slide please so now uh, some of the actions that need to be taken for uh, marine ecosystem restoration so pakistan is committed to fulfill its obligation related to protection of national environment we already have uh, established marine protected areas and uh, pakistan also plans to declare 10% of its marine and coastal areas under protected areas coverage which will increase and further meetings have been held with stakeholders and uh, three potential sites have been uh, identified uh, rasmalan uh, provincial uh, jurisdiction of uh, balochistan uh, this comes under balochistan and uh, of uh, pasni and the rocky headland located at uh, malan pasni or mara as marine protected areas so these areas they have a lot of biodiversity turtles come here to lay eggs fish uh, diversity uh, fish stocks are plentiful here but they need to be protected Let's we use this valuable resource, and then uh, Gawada is already a declared a marine protected area, specially known for the presence of its uh, cetacean species. Cetaceans uh, include dolphins and whales, uh, Arabian humpback whales, blue whales, bright whales. Uh, they are regularly sighted in these regions. Uh, two other uh, sites, Omar Turtle Beach and Astola Island. these are very valuable resources in terms of biodiversity and resources uh, next slide please let's speak a bit about the value of these uh, ecosystems so creek areas in sin uh, in continuation to my last point they have great value to marine ecosystem with its duly recognized ecological and biological importance and variety of habitats uh, the indus river discharges in the sea through uh, the, the creek areas in sin another important fact is that these have mud flats so mud flats are another uh, important blue economy resource and mangroves again mangroves they are home to a variety of marine birds uh, breeding and nesting grounds for several species of marine fish and invertebrates uh this also includes turtles which are not mentioned on uh, in the slide though uh part of parts of the indus river mangroves are known to be the largest arid area mangrove forest of the world uh this area has a uh, significance for migratory species of fish uh the indus uh, estuarine area has diversified bird fauna including cranes flamingos pelicans waders coots ducks gulls and terns so we have a lot of biodiversity in terms of birds as well and uh, now uh, i think uh, for the eco economy people the greatest value for mangroves is their role as carbon sinks so uh, carbon trading and carbon credits are a thing so they can act as carbon sinks as well they can sequester huge amounts of carbon and play an important role in carbon uh, credits carbon budget and are good for tackling the climate change issue uh, they are also considered among the key uh, blue uh, carbon habitats the other two being tidal marshes and sea grass meadows uh, among the most carbon rich forests in the tropics it is estimated that man mangroves are able to sequester 6 to 8 tons of carbon dioxide per hectare per year and surprisingly this exceeds the tropical forests by about 2 to 4 times the rate of sequestration so this needs to be kept in mind that this is a very valuable resources and we need to be very careful and very responsible with its usage uh, next slide please so uh, these are some facts and figures that uh, should be mentioned uh, according to red plus readiness study 
A sampling was conducted on 79 sample plots and limited to one pilot site and sin. Uh, this study uh, estimated that carbon sequestration uh, has been estimated in 9.10 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent per hectare per year in biomass and 7.68 tons of carbon uh, dioxide per hectare per year in soils. Uh, however, the soil uh, thing uh, needs to be further investigated because it showed higher demand. So let's take that with a grain of salt duration initiatives and to benefit from red plus payment mechanisms. Pakistan also plans to declare more areas at main protected system as I've already said, but uh, this will be done through consultations with custodian communities, provincial governments and other interest groups as leadership in Pakistan believes that until uh, we prioritize marine and coastal ecosystem, we cannot make our development truly sustainable. And uh, next we'll talk about some uh, obligations and international agreements. Uh, so Pakistan is a signatory to various conventions and treaties uh, for the protection of environment and biodiversity, including marine and coastal biodiversity. Uh, uh, I think you can see a list of these. Uh, Paris Agreement, most important uh, from the previous years. Uh, now we have the Glasgow Pact, uh, Convention on Trade of Endangered Species, uh, Ramsar Convention, Kyoto Protocol, uh, United Nations Conventions uh, on Law of Sea, uh, the Basel Convention, Stockholm Convention, and Sendai Framework on Disaster Risk Reduction. So coming uh, closer to the national level, uh, we have also established uh, a Marine Pollution Control Board since uh, 1994, a National Institute of Oceanology in 1981, and formulation of Pakistan's National Strategy and Action Plan uh, sometime in the past as well. Due to Pakistan's commitment toward climate change, uh, our country uh, was interested to host the uh, uh, launch of the uh, World Environment Day 2021. And this piggyback uh, as Dr. Shapkis has already mentioned. So uh, we have a rich potential of marine ecosystem amid uh, a variety of degradation threats and challenges. So uh, it is necessary that the federal and provincial governments pay special attention to this issue and play their role in protecting the marine and uh, coastal ecosystems. So uh, one example is the 10 billion tree tsunami program. And this is a flagship of the ecosystem restoration programs. So perhaps something similar could be done uh, in terms of coral reef restorations. And uh, this has already been initiated in uh, countries such as Mauritius. Uh, that's one I uh, have been following uh, recently. And what they do is they take uh, tiny fragments of corals and they put them underwater in the sea and they grow new corals. So this is also helping uh, combat some threats to biodiversity. Uh, we can, uh, we have to control our emissions so we can uh, mitigate ocean acidification and other threats related to this uh, blue part of our world. So the marine ecosystem, uh, all right, all right. I'll, uh, so can we just move on to the next slide? Yes, the policy recommendation. So uh, the World Bank has uh, made a few policy recommendations and uh, I'll be sharing something uh, from those. Uh, there are two types of uh, policy recommendations, blue carbon economy implementations. So the research side, uh, it's, uh, advises to focus on improving the mapping and monitoring of blue carbon ecosystem through time. So we have to consider time scales as well. Work on updating national greenhouse gas inventory and prepare for accounting of nationally determined contributions. Uh, identifying and evaluating key pressures on blue carbon marine systems in Pakistan. Uh, investing in research to evaluate and map co-benefits provided by the blue carbon economy, uh, ecosystem, sorry. Uh, we, we also have to strengthen education, training, and engagement because uh, until and unless there's awareness and engagement with the public, we cannot move uh, at a rapid pace. And then uh, comes the, uh, the blue economy implementation side. So we have to review and improve institutional arrangements. Uh, we need to work on capacity building. 
Uh, we have to review and implement uh, climate change adaptation options, review and implement uh, climate migration, uh, sorry, mitigation modalities. These were some policy recommendations, and uh, I think uh, with that, we're done. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Salman, for your presentation on the uh, marine ecosystem. And uh, during the presentation, you have touched upon a couple of things. We have uh, some more stuff on that, for example, blue economy, blue carbon economy. And uh, he talked about when he was talking about uh, mangroves, he talked about the uh, forest uh, sector. So we have two more experts on that. Uh, for, first, uh, I would request uh, Dr. Sarish to you for her presentation on post-pandemic blue economy, a contribution towards ecosystem restoration 2030 and sustainable social yeah. development. Over to you, Dr. Sarish. Hello, Assalamu alaikum. Am I audible? Yes, Sarish. All right, thank you so much. Uh, it's really a pleasure for me to join this STC and Again, the specific panel of ecosystem restoration, my best gratitude to Shakta Saab and SDPI for granting me this opportunity. I will try to be very precise by sharing a few facts and figures. Uh, let uh, me share. Uh, can you please display my presentation? Uh, Sir, my, pres my presentation is displayed or not? It's displayed. Carry on. All right. All right. And this, uh, then move to the first slide. Uh, today I'm presenting on a post pandemic blue economy, a contribution towards ecosystem restoration, <laughs> green economy. And. Parish, please be precise while telling this. We are already short of time. So, so right. you have. So just take your time and uh, just uh, give us the differences and major things. Yes, okay. Thank you very much. All right. Um, before discussing anything, just go towards the definition of our blue economy, what actually the international uh, studios and international forums say about. So the World Bank says that sustainable use of oceanic resources for economic growth, improved livelihoods, jobs, and ocean system health. So here the question rises is that what is the need of the time and the aim of a blue economy? So what importantly I'm talking about is that what actually we need, that is to recreate a relationship with the planet. I kind of move to the next slide. Uh, needing to recreate a relationship with the uh, planet and this, um, like in developing a relationship, there is an undeniable linkage between the blue economy and ecosystem restoration. The next slide, please. So this undeniable linkage is the sustainable use of ocean resources by maintaining the oceanic health, uh, which will leading towards lessening the stress on terrestrial as well as the marine ecosystem. Uh, ecosystem by disturbing the supply chains, halting normal routines, raised unemployment leading to the social economic strains, was an other site, and um, these both parallel sites may be joined in a way to maintain an ecosystem by a blue economy and by saving the environment from further damage, which has already been, been done. So, uh, kindly move to the next slide. Blue economy is a multi dimensional as well as the economic activities under the realm are the sea dependent. Why I am saying this because it includes tourism, marine transport, energy, and fishing sectors. So, uh, considering this type, uh, kindly move to the next slide. Uh, so, considering ecosystem health, it is very important to talk about nowadays that right after the COP26, there have been a more urgent need to revive the damaged ecosystem than now. So as UNGA secretary stated in COP26, and he addressed that it is an important step, but is not enough. And we must accelerate climate action to keep alive the goal of limiting global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees. Uh, can we move to the next slide? So the ecosystem support of all life on earth, because as people, so the UN decade on ecosystem restoration aims to prevent, halt, and reverse the degradation process of ecosystem and uh, in every continent and in every ocean. And it can help to end poverty, combat climate change, and prevent mass extinction. And it will not only exceed 
succeeds if everyone is not playing its part. So considering this uh, now uh, connecting into the SDGs, uh, according to the research, SDG 14 lies below and production of all kinds of resources. Either those are the marine resources or they can uh, land-based resources. So uh, moving towards a situation like restriction to reduce the human interaction have helped to avoid a greater suffering and adapt from the COVID-19. Kindly move to the next slide. So during the COVID-19 pandemic, we have also created a socioeconomic hardship. Like this was a disruption is unprecedented in the modern era of global observing networks, pervasive sensing, and a large scale tracking of human mobility and behavior, and uh, creating a unique test by the foot understanding the heart system. In this perspective, we uh, hypothesize the mediation of long term earth system responses to the COVID 19 pandemic, too, along in the two multidisciplinary cascades like energy, emission, food, and biodiversity. By looking into the short term view, uh, we see that impacts are dominated by the direct uh, effects rising from the reduced human activity, longer lasting impacts on the likely result from cascading effects of economic recession, uh, global poverty, green investment, and human behavior. Why these? Because these impacts offer the opportunity for the novel insights, particularly with the careful deployment of targeted data collection, coordinated model experiments, and solution-oriented randomized control trials and during after the pandemic. Here we have a few very precise way forward, like I'm not going into the detail that is all embedded into my uh, detailed research paper, kindly to move towards the way forwards. How the ecosystem regulate water and carbon stores the carbon, so, the, so does oil, and sea grasses in the ocean, and even human bodies, 18% carbon. But as an ecosystem become weak, they release the carbon instead of storing it. So healthy soil grows 90% of our food uh, but pollution, climate change, pesticides are making the soil less productive. So while the yield goes down, we turn and change the land into the wild place, wild, wild places into the farmlands and polluting the uh, healthy soil, and we lose the forest. Wildlife is forced to come close to the human brain. Like it is very important thing to understand that when we are uh, deforesting. The wildlife is coming towards the human life. And there, the diseases have been transferred. That is called zoonotic diseases. Like uh, the viruses have been passed between the animals and the humans, like the bird flu, Ebola, and this COVID 19 uh, pandemic, which we are facing from the last two years. So, but there are some actions we can take uh, towards growing uh, trees in the cities. We're going to have to cut out the pollution dramatically. They could filter and cool the air, improving their health and reducing the global warming. Uh, but the trees can do more. Look at the mangroves, for instance, we are uh, spending the, uh, multiple billion dollars and they protect our coastline from the storms and floods. Building economies in nature will create jobs for the future, jobs that you can have, and all the restoring ecosystem will not only simple, it's not that easy, but together we can do that. Can you move to the next slide, please? And I believe in you know, one thing that land divides, but sea connects. It is a slogan that emphasizes the prerequisites of the maritime management and security. Life below water needs to be conserved for a sustainable blue economy and a post-COVID world like entrepreneurs, thinkers, leaders have to be involved in our family, schools, and workplace. Everyone has to do its parts and had to find a way out. Here, one thing has to be very bluntly mentioned that sea resources are at risk due to illegal and overfishing, marine pollutants, and sea-based mining, which needs to shift to conserve and restore the marine ecosystem. Can you please move to the next slide? Here I'm sharing a very important fact that uh, uh, Pakistan Navy and uh, um, our CGS, like the China Geological Survey, had a MOU in uh, 2013. And on the first expedition, uh, they reported that Pakistan in Pakistan nautical miles was at a good chunk of marine resources, including fresh hydrocarbons and many attached potentials are there. And according to the first expedition results, Via Bahir Masa, that was a collaboration of Pakistan Navy with the CGS, and they uh, highlighted that reservoirs of about 20 oil equivalent are present in Pakistani nautical miles. We have to find it, we have to conserve these resources, and we have to utilize it very properly and very productively. 
So here I'm just giving an overview of the few possible options, right? To take a solution towards a social economic development and a sustainable oceanic health. Kindly move towards the next slide. This is the image that is highlighting the area covered in the first CGS expedition in 2018. This is the region uh, moving from Gavada to Oramara that is near the beach of Karachi and uh, extended towards the exclusive economic zone in the continental shelf of Pakistan. And trust me, revenue generation, and it can be a second largest province of Pakistan. Uh, kindly move towards the next slide. Um, so the two very precise options which I'm giving as a way forward are the aquaculture. One is aquaculture. Aquaculture is a rather a recent activity in Pakistan and it still is an infancy because in the world is, there is an immense potential for uh, development of the sector, despite as a wasp fresh and a brackish and a marine water resources, but only the carp culture is practiced in inland waters and only a limited scale. So the carp are cultured in an other point, like I have uh, shown you in the picture here, um, using mostly extensive farming practices with a little input. So in the Pakistan, fish fauna is rich. Like I can quote that only the seven warm water species and the two cold water species are cultivated on a commercial level. So the trials experimented with the shrimp culture have been carried out in the Indus Delta region, and it has not succeeded because due to the non-availability of the hash to produce seeds. So what important is that we already have established industries. We have to improve the capacity building of those uh, industries. We have to invest and modernize those um, procedures so that we can have a better production rate. Then I come towards the fisheries. Uh, fisheries sectors as a whole contributes about to the 1% of country's GDP and provide jobs about the 1% of the country's labor force, which is really less. And it can be uh, increased to tenfold, according to the CTS report. So the freshwater carp farming is the major aquaculture activity in the three of the country's four provinces, that is the Punjab, Sin, Northwest Frontier Province, which is now the Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. So the northern mountains of Pakistan have a good potential of a trout culture, but production in these colder regions is still very small, again, due to the low technological advancements and uh, availability of equipments. Uh, then coming towards uh, the last portion that is the Pakistan's organization's role and responsibilities. This is the most important thing because organization important is that agriculture in Pakistan is basically a provincial responsibility. At the central level, fisheries is the responsibility of the Office of Fisheries Development, Commercial FDC Working, under the Ministry of Food, Agriculture and Livestock, that is called MENPOL. So the Office of the FDC is responsible for policy, planning and coordination with the provincial fisheries department and other national international agencies. So what I am suggesting is to bring a cooperation, to bring a possible and a workable and a feasible option so that the both department can increase the collaboration so that whatever already has been invested, that must be enhanced, that production rate has to be enhanced rather than establishing an entirely new ministry, an entirely new department. So please put your effort in already established organizations, already established departments, like Pakistani Agricultural Research Council Park is the country's largest research organization and is responsible to make call for adding information and all of the supporting in, uh, regarding different projects and some universities. We have to work together. We have to make an effort together to have a positive and a concrete results. That was all from my side. And thank you so much for the cooperation. Any question is welcome. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sarish Kalum, for your presentation. You have rightly mentioned that uh, health is somehow linked to the ecosystem, which is marine ecosystem. Uh, I'm not, uh, you know, discussing your paper here, uh, my presentation here, more because, sure, uh, you know, capacity of time, we have to move forward. We have the last speaker with us, Dr. Babar Shabazz from the University of Faisalabad, uh, Agriculture Faisalabad. Over to you, Dr. Sir. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shafta, for organizing uh, such an important uh, event webinar. And it is always a pleasure to uh, be part of uh, this uh, SDPA Sustainable Development Conference. So, can you share my screen or my presentation on the screen? Yes, it has appeared here. Carry on. Okay. I will. Uh, 
restrict my presentation uh, in 10 minutes. Uh, basically, it is a two based presentation. I will be presenting some uh, facts and figures of terrestrial ecosystem. My main presentation is about uh, restoration of terrestrial ecosystem of Pakistan. And then I will be uh, talking about uh, degradation of terrestrial ecosystem. And then uh, I will be uh, giving a brief overview of recent initiatives for restoration of terrestrial ecosystem. And then a quick analysis and uh, the way in the form of the ways forward. Next slide, please. <coughs> so ecosystem are very important for the food security, for the all components of food security. And terrestrial ecosystem in particular, they have the most important role in ensuring the food security by supporting agricultural production and water share. And degradation of ecosystem along with poor ecosystem governance, it limits the ability of farmer to produce food. And consequently, it uh, leads to the food insecurity. Next, please. Ecosystem, they contribute to every component, every pillar of the food security, from the utilization, availability, access, and stability, all components. Next, please. About 79.6 million hectares of total land and only 22, 28% of that area is under cultivation, which is roughly 22 million hectares. And 50% of uh, Pakistan land is the range land. And only 5% uh, of the total land area is uh, under the some sort of forest cover. And rest of the land is uh, barren land, scrubs, and alpine pasture, water body, human settlement, and other uh, orchard and subalpine forest. Next, please. So terrestrial ecosystem, 49% uh, of land area is more than 85% of it. And in some studies, says that about 90% of land area of Pakistan is arid or semi-arid. So Pakistan is generally a dry country. Only 6% is subhumid zone. And as many as 100 field and horticultural crops are being grown in these ecologies and uh, which are a uh, very important uh, source of food security for the uh, people uh, living in this country. Next slide, please. So, uh, although Pakistan have a meager forest cover, but uh, we have uh, good uh, protected areas. There are as many as uh, 398 protected area which are have been spread throughout uh, the countries in all the four provinces and Gilgit Baltistan. There are uh, national parks, game reserves, wildlife sanctuaries, wetlands, under Ramsar Convention and community reserves. Next, please. percent of the rangeland are located in the arid and semi-arid uh, areas and rest are in the high rainfall alpine pasture. And the studies uh, indicate that 60% feed for the goat and sheep and 40% for the camel. While in some, this is the, from the FAO, while some other studies say that about 90% of the uh, feed for the goat, sheep, and camel, they come from the rangeland. And if 95% of the forest of Pakistan is natural forest, 28% dry temperate, and there are some other different categories of forest, so they are quite diversified categories of forest, but uh, the per capita uh, forest is very low. It is 0 0.021 hectare as compared to the one hectare per person of, of the world average. Next, please. So degradation of ecosystem. So uh, first we talk about the forest. 27,000 hectares of forest are being lost every year, which is the 1.6% uh, uh, deforestation rate and in fact in Asia it is the second highest and in the world it is one of the uh, among the uh, top uh, 10 uh, deforestation rate uh, in the world and uh, if we talk about the land uh, degradation 11 million hectares of land are affected by the water 
and 4.4 to 5 million hectares are affected by the wind erosion. So water erosion and wind erosion, these are the two main uh, uh, causes of the land degradation. And uh, more than 5 million hectares are affected by the salinity and sodicity. So the huge proportion of land uh, is being degraded due to either water erosion, soil erosion, drought, flooding, soil nutrient degradation. These are also uh, causing the water uh, land erosion, uh, land degradation. And in fact, uh, our soils are generally deficient in the nutrients. And the same nutrients which are deficient in soil over most of the population is also deficient in that nutrients. For example, our generally our soils are uh, zinc deficient and majority of Pakistan population is also zinc uh, deficient. So it is the concept of one health. Any the soil health, the land health is directly affecting the human health. Next, please. So you can see in this graph that in Punjab, the wind erosion is major, uh, causing the uh, land degradation, and water erosion is the major culprit causing the land degradation. Next slide, please. So there are some initiatives uh, by the uh, government. So I will be talking about the recent initiatives. The most important is the 10 billion tree tsunami project, which was started in 1918. So most of us know about it. it is the continuation of uh, the billion tree tsunami project in the Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province. And under this uh, project, the uh, target of 1 billion tree was achieved in the mid 21. Uh, 2021 and the United Nations acknowledged Pakistan's success on ecosystem restoration and selected Pakistan as the host for World Environment Day. And then the Protected Area Initiative, it is the key component of 10 billion tree tsunami. In fact, 10 billion tree tsunami has various components. And Protected Area Initiative is the key component. It aims at developing 15 more uh, protected area across countries. And uh, about uh, more than 7,000 square kilometer of land area. The target is that to further increase the area by 15% by 2023. And also uh, the increase in number of the national parks, game reserves, and all these. Uh, next slide, please. Another initiative is ecosystem restoration uh, uh, initiative. And in fact, it is the uh, there is a larger uh, project called Pakistan Hydro Meteorological and Ecosystem Restoration Project, which is 188 million US dollar project by the government of Pakistan and ecosystem restoration is a key component. And the major focus uh, is on the uh, conservation of forest and biodiversity and restoration of about 30% of degraded forest, 6% of degraded rangelands and 10% of degraded wetlands. And then we have sustainable forest management. In fact, the complete name of project is the sustainable forest management to secure multiple benefits in Pakistan high conservation areas. So uh, this is the project uh, funded by the Global Environment Facility and UNDP. And its uh, main uh, target is to uh, manage the forest on sustainable uh, ways, uh, particularly the uh, coniferous Himalayan Riverine and Sagara Forest. And this project uh, concentrate on about 150. And then uh, Red Plus Pakistan. Red Plus is in the implementation stage uh, in Pakistan. And in, the, in fact, in June 2020, the government uh, has provided additional 4 million US dollar for implementation of Red Plus. Next, please. So what is the quick analysis? First, uh, when we analyze uh, these initiatives, uh, the recent initiative, which was in, uh, initiated during the last uh, five to six years, we find the absence of participatory ecosystem governance. As Dr. Mushtaq uh, Mehman talked in his uh, opening uh, speech, that the ecosystem governance has to be holistic in nature. We cannot uh, say that management of forest separately or the management of marine resources or management of governance of uh, rangeland. It has to be holistic, it has to be participatory governance. And it has to be backed by the customary and statutory laws. Lot of 
conflict has occurred uh, when the uh, forest management, the joint forest management initiative was uh, undertaken in the late 90s and 2000. Uh, the main aspect behind that was the ignorance of customary and statutory laws. And then ecosystem supporting food security policies. There is There are trade-offs between ecosystem conservation and food production, but uh, in our food security policies, the ecosystem restoration or ecosystem governance, it is generally uh, absent or it is generally not taken care of. And improving land management, as I said, that the health of soil, health of land directly affects the human health. So this is the concept of one health. The health of livestock directly helps the human health. So it lead, leads to the better uh, human health. And next, please. Uh, as I said that in my uh, previous slide, that 50% of our land is consists of rangelands, and it is generally an ignored uh, aspect. The rangeland management, rangeland governance, restoration of land, rangeland, it has been ignored uh, in most of the policies. There are very uh, small scale projects uh, targeted the uh, towards the restoration of rangeland lands. But there is need to prioritize the rangeland management in national policies, establishment of independent organization for rangeland management. Most of whenever we talk about the ecosystem restoration, directly uh, we go to the forest restoration, forest conservation. That's fine. But Pakistan is generally a rangeland uh, country over most of the land consists of ranges, pastures. So, and this is an ignored area which I need a concentration from the policy maker. So it was a very quick overview of uh, ecosystem, uh, terrestrial ecosystem of Pakistan and current state and some recent initiatives. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Baba Shabasa, for uh, providing us uh, an overview of the terrestrial ecosystem. And uh, you know, particularly its linkage with food security because uh, the debates are on then uh, climate change and uh, you know earlier uh, Adam has talked about the heat stress uh, relating things. They ultimately impact the food, and you very rightly has pointed out and given us the ideas how you know the, whether it's uh, you know range land management system. Uh, particularly, you talked about ecosystem supportive food security policy. These are very pertinent and um, in, in Pakistan, also very important. Thank you, Dr. Bhadra, for your uh, input. And now, uh, uh, I would request uh, uh, Dr. Abdul Salari for his concluding remarks. Dr. Abdul Salari is actually, uh, uh, which Adam and uh, Dr. Bhadra Shabazz has mentioned about. And he has been recently appointed by the Prime Minister, uh, in addition to his role of uh, uh, Economic Advisor Council, he's the convener of uh, a committee which looks at uh, the National Agriculture Transformation Plan. Over to you, Dr. Good morning, uh, Dr. Bhadra Shabazz, and uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, depending uh, uh, wherever uh, you are. Uh, watching uh, the live stream of uh, this session. Uh, well, uh, uh, thanks, uh, thanks, stream panelists, for highlighting this uh, very important issue of uh, ecosystem restoration and ecosystem protection. Uh, one knows that rat restoration may lead us to a stage where future generations of humans may have to carry personal oxygen devices to breathe. Uh, just like now we have uh, had to adopt to face masks. If we don't mend our ways, then living on Earth and Mars or any other planet may be a similar experience one day. And uh, this is uh, the future that, of course, we don't want uh, for our uh, next generation. Overexploitation by 1.6 times of uh, natural resources, uh, then the planet can replenish, is embedded in economies and governance, mining hard-growing development gains, 
and oceans to forests to farmland, the world's ecosystem are being degraded. And uh, this is uh, what uh, we tried uh, highlighting uh, in COP26 in uh, Glasgow. Uh, of course, a lot needs to be done, uh, but the mere fact that today uh, uh, across all continents, this uh, subject of ecosystem restoration is being discussed. I think it's a heartening time. And uh, I uh, thank uh, all the speakers and uh, panelists uh, for sharing their uh, words of wisdom. Uh, the recommendations uh, that comes, Pakistan, uh, Pakistan uh, relevant recommendations uh, would be uh, shared uh, with relevant ministry and relevant authorities uh, for their consideration and for implementation. Over to you, Shafiq. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sowari. Now, uh, ladies and gentlemen and the distinguished panelists, we have uh, the message from the from Honorable Minister for Climate Change, uh, Ms. Zarkaj Gochava. May I request you to say the message? and participants, assalamu alaikum. It is a matter of pride for us that our green initiatives have changed the country's global branding and today the world admires and acknowledges Pakistan as a champion uh, of the cause of ecosystem restoration. Within the last few years, the country stood tall with its flagship ecosystem restoration, 10 billion tree tsunami program that really made a wonder uh, with series of action aimed at restoring nature, protecting lives and livelihoods in honor of planting the billionaire tree leading the 10 billion tree targets. Ladies and gentlemen, the United Nations General Assembly decided to observe the decade on ecosystem restoration 2021-2023. Only with healthy ecosystem, we can enhance people's livelihood, contract climate change, and stop the collapse of biodiversity. The UNF data says that half of the world's GDP is dependent on nature. Looking at the current state of affairs, just imagine if ecosystem degradation continues, it may cost 10 trillion US dollars to global GDP by 2050. If we want to protect nature and environment over the next 10 years, we have to achieve the targets set under the UN docket. The UN docket on ecosystem restoration ends at the same time the SDG will be completed in 2030. Imagine if we are in a position to achieve all 17 of the elimination of poverty and hunger by 2030. By achieving the one challenge by restoring 350 million hectares of degraded and deforested lands around the world would create to US 9 trillion in net benefits. A restoration through a forestry uh, alone has the potential to increase food security for 1.3 billion people. 10 billion tsunami project or program is built on the successful initiative or have a Pakhtun Compromises Billion Tree Afforestation Project. The outcome of Billion Tree Afforestation Project have been duly acknowledged by the World Economic Forum. United Nations Environment Program, Bond Challenge, and other international bodies and fora. With plantation of 1 billionth tree on 27th May 2021, the government of Pakistan kicked off the goal of 10 billion tree plantation across the country. The government of Pakistan has launched the Ecosystem Restoration Initiative, ESRI, for facilitating transition towards environmentally resilient Pakistan. The initiative also seeks to establish an independent, transparent, and comprehensive financial mechanism in Pakistan called Ecosystem Restoration Fund, ESRF, to finance the projects and programs under the initiative. Recently, we have launched Protected Area Initiative to develop 15 model protected areas across the country to conserve over more than 7,000 square kilometers of land area. Greening of China-Pakistan CPEC initiative is underway through which a planned coal power plant is being replaced with two renewable energy projects to, re uh, to reduce carbon footprints. During the current situation of pandemic, uh, our Ministry of Climate Change has launched a green economic stimulus 
which aims at promoting environmental activities which have economic impacts. We are committed to reduce the risk from Lishan to strengthen the resilience of community. These are some of the green initiatives Pakistan has undertaken. Uh, I have quoted the figure from global and national data for the readers to uh, give an overview of this situation. But we have to think beyond figures and we have to think green to achieve the real purpose of restoring our ecosystem for survival of our own and future generation. I would like to thank STPI and WFP for bringing together experts to discuss issues and ecosystems, their various dimensions and their impacts on people and the planet. I once again thank you for your participation in the discussion on such an important topic. Pakistan Zindaba, thank you. Thank you, Honorable Minister, for your message. Uh, now, time is endless. Kindly come up with your question very brief. If there is something online, if somebody, some question online or from the audience, uh, then we can take it up. If not, then I would, yeah. Please, just take the mic at the bottom. You see, this uh, planet uh, belongs to all of us, and uh, that's why when we are talking about ecosystem restoration, ecosystem uh, protection, uh, we can't only leave uh, things to be done by the government. Uh, it is uh, the uh, climate threats, they are uh, so uh, predominant uh, that uh, no single government in the world can uh, tackle them, no single society can tackle them, and no single individual can tackle them. Uh, we have uh, in order that uh, even if we don't receive anything from climate financing funds or from uh, developed nations, uh, we have to uh, use our indigenous resources. Uh, we have to adapt to uh, the changing climate and we have to uh, protect and uh, preserve uh, our uh, ecosystem. So uh, all these things that we need to do, it's a, a sort of a moral binding on us if we really want uh, to uh, leave a livable planet uh, for the future generations. So uh, small steps uh, at individual level, uh, collective steps at a societal level, and then of course uh, a lot uh, at government level, both tribal as well as provincial, uh, that needs to be done. And uh, within this context, the role of private sector is uh, quite important and uh, uh, we have to take the private sector along. So it's not only uh, civil society and uh, governments and international funders are our donors, but uh, private sectors uh, as well. Uh, again, uh, it's a collective effort. Thank you very much. Uh, I guess uh, no more questions. Uh, then uh, I would like to thank all of you who participated here in person. But under the COVID SOPs, we have invited very limited gathering here. And thank you all those who have participated online uh, for this session. My special thanks to the Honorable Minister uh, for the message. Uh, and then I, I'm thankful to Dr. Abu Sulayi that he were with us. And uh, thank you, Dr. Mushtaq um, Ahmed Menon Saab, Adam Sivli, uh, Mr. Iftakhar Saab, Dr. Sarish, Dr. Babar Shabazz, and Salman Banish for the presentation. With this, I would like to thank you again. Thank you so much. And now it is close of the session. Thanks.